Welcome to my talk, Spatial Frequencies and Degrees of Freedom in Near Field Communications. I am Emil Björnsson from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and this is joint work with Nicolas, Aslem and Alva, with whom I wrote this signal processing magazine paper, Spatial Frequencies and Degrees of Freedom. So I will explain those concepts in this video. So the basic thing with a wireless signal is that we are transmitting it by modulating data onto a carrier wave. And the signal might be represented by S here, some complex number that is modulated onto a wavelength lambda. And when the signal is transmitted from the source, the real and imaginary part will oscillate up like this. And when you observe it at different locations along a line, uh, so x is a variable here along the line, well then we will get different phase shift depending on where we are on this line. And the distance between two peak values is 1 over the wavelength lambda. And this is something that will also be important when the signal reaches the receiver. So say that we are transmitted from a certain location towards an array here. The array consists of the elements that are black, but we also are showing the phase shifts uh, so we're looking, for example, on the real part from minus uh, 1 to 1. And we see how that is creating some shape over the surface and that we are sampling that on different locations. So we get numbers between 1 and minus 1 uh, on the surface and when we are measuring things with our antennas. If the signal comes from a different location, in this case it comes from an angle 30 degrees in the azimuth plane, well then we will see another shape over our surface. And when we sample that impinging electrical field at different location, we will get another combination of numbers in our real and imaginary part describing our channel. And we can have even more complicated properties here over the surface when, in this case, we have four far field path impinging from different angles. We create a certain shape that is not very easy to interpret in this case, and we sample it with our antennas. But the point I want to make with this slide is that a channel between a single antenna transmitter and this base station array is characterized by the spatial frequency variations that we will have from our impinging waveform onto the panel where we have our antennas and the antenna locations where we are sampling that wave. And this is in generally a characterization of our channel. So if we look at the basic user setup, we have a user here uh, in line of sight to a base station array. We have antennas in a uniform linear array fashion with delta to spacing. In this case, we have a delta equal to lambda over two, so half wavelength spacing, and we have n antennas. And antenna n is located at i n, that is an index along the axis here, times delta. And if we want to describe this channel, well, we can describe it based on how far away the user is from the origin and the angle with respect to this y-axis here. And in that case, we can write this channel vector, which will be an n-dimensional vector because we have n antennas, as some kind of common factor times a so-called near-field array response vector that depends on the angle and the distance. And the basic thing is that this near-field array response vector is describing the phase shift that the different antennas have as compared to what the phase shift would be at the origin. So you basically take the distance differences between a particular antenna, so distance to antenna 1, 2 and so on, we subtract it from the distance to the origin and we multiply with 2 pi over lambda and then we get the different phase shifts. So this is a general representation that we can have in a lot of different um, near field line of sight scenarios or far field for that matter. In some cases, people like to take this d minus the distance to a particular antenna and do some kind of near field approximations. It's an expansion like this you can do just using trigonometry, and then we can make a Taylor expansion and keep only some of the terms and get one term that depends on the angle and the antenna distance. And we can have a second term here that is quadratic in the antenna index and also depends on how far away the user is. This is representing the spherical wavefronts, but in this way in a parabolic way. So this is something you could enter and make a simplified expression of the near field array response vector, but it's not necessary to do that. One can use this more general expression if you want to. But what one could do 
is to consider a far-field approximation where you also drop the last term here, only keeping this term, and in that case we can simplify the whole near-field array response vector into this far-field array response vector which you are most likely familiar with. This function depends on the uppercase theta, which is the cosine of the lowercase theta. So it's also known as the directional cosine. And we have that value multiplied with the index along the axis here times j and pi, and that is giving us the different phase shifts. So this is exactly how this near field array response vector would look like when we are far away, so we are not seeing any spherical wavefronts at all. If you give me a channel vector h, we can analyze its spatial frequency content by multiplying it with the DFT matrix. And interestingly, the DFT matrix can be described using this far field array response vectors for equally spaced directional cosines. So they are going from zero up to n minus one divided by n. So this is some kind of normalized frequencies. And what we're actually doing here is if we take a DFT of a spatial signal, H, normally we take time domain signals and we take the DFT of those ones, but this is how we are getting the spatial frequencies. Here's an example of how to do this. We have 16 antennas here along the y-axis, and we have a signal impinging from a angle of two pi over three. In that case, the spatial frequency of that signal, where we are observing it over here, will be to take cosine of this angle divided by lambda, which we can write as minus 0.5 times lambda or minus 4 over 8 times lambda. And if we are then calculating this discrete Fourier transform of it, then the coefficients of this HSF, where SF stands for spatial frequencies, looks like this. All of the DFT content is in the bin representing our spatial frequency and there's nothing at other frequencies. So this is a simple way of representing a channel which is only a line of sight component using our DFTs or spatial frequencies. We only have one spatial frequency. And in general, we can interpret this spatial DFT that we are calculating in terms of that there is a collection of signal directions which are equally spaced in than this directional cosine domain. So any channel can be written as a linear combination of these far field array response vectors by just taking this inverse DFT uh, of the representation using spatial frequencies. So we're basically just taking this different uh, array response vectors and we take a linear combination represented by this HSF vector. And all of these uh, spatial frequencies are equally spaced and that is sort of the basis of how to generate this kind of channels. Uh, we have the same number of vectors as we have antennas, so there is a one-to-one -one mapping. We're basically just changing the basis function in our vector space. And we have selected this specific uh, equally spaced directional cosines, so we make sure that the columns here are orthogonal to each other. So what will then happen if we have a near field channel? Well, we can still take any channel vector and multiply it with the DFT matrix. In this case, we know that in general, H is the near field array response vector times some common factor that is not really important in this case. We still define F in the same way as before. So let's take an example. We have 60 antennas again along the y-axis, but now we have a signal impinging from the same angle as before, but not from the far field, but instead from a distance that is relatively near, just five wavelengths away. And you can see how we have this spherical wavefront in this case. So what will happen with this spatial DFT of a near field channel? Well, here I'm showing the frequency content, the magnitude of what we'll get for each of these entries. And we see that the spherical wave actually consists of all the spatial frequencies in this example. And this is because we have a signal that is really close by and spreads out over all of the spatial frequencies. In general, we can get some other representation here, but the main point is that we can have this one-to-one -one mapping between near field channels and spatial frequencies. If we take it one step further, well, in this case, we have a lot of antennas, 225 antennas, and we have a signal impinging from angle pi over three at varying distances. This is a 15 gigahertz system. And if we have a signal that is coming from a source five meters away, we get this blue spatial DFT. 
We get the red one when the source is 25 meters away, and we get this black one here when it's 506 meters away, which is the Fraunhofer distance, usually viewed as the far field distance. So what you can see is that the values on the spatial DFTs that are non-zero depends on how far away the source is. So we can say that our signal has some kind of spatial bandwidth. That is the number of effective spatial frequencies that are non-zero. So at the five meter distance, we have this spatial bandwidth. At 25 meters, it shrinks and becomes even smaller, but actually not uh, only containing one element when we are at the Fraunhofer distance. So the main point here is that we have n spatial frequencies that exist in total, that is what we get from our spatial DFT, but a varying number of non-zero effective spatial frequencies. We will now take a closer look at how the number of effective spatial frequencies depends on the distance and the angle. So in the first graph here, we're considering a varying distance on the horizontal axis. We have a signal impinging from the broadside direction. And at the very short distance, the number of effective spatial frequencies is roughly 50 out of the 225 spatial frequencies that we are getting in this case. Then it reduces with the propagation distance. And after 71 meters in this case, we have a far field like scenario where only one spatial frequency is really strong. And we can continue up towards the Fraunhofer distance. And we see that in this case, we actually get few spatial frequencies already at shorter distances, which is an indicator of that the Fraunhofer distance is not actually the near field boundary for these purposes. Then in the second graph here, we have a varying angle and we are considering a very short distance. We start at this distance over here, where we still have 50 effective spatial frequencies. And we have a symmetric pattern here. So when we move away from the broadside direction, we get fewer and fewer effective spatial frequencies. And the basic reason for that is that the array will look smaller when we view it from a non-broadside direction. And that means that the channel variations will be lumped together into a smaller number of spatial frequency bits. Let's have a look at what impact all of this has on communications. So in a multi-user scenario like this with N antennas at our base station and K users, we would like their channel vectors, which are N-dimensional vectors, to be orthogonal to each other. If they are not, they will cause interference between each other unless we are using some advanced precoding like regularized zero fortune to cancel interference. The more orthogonal they are, the better the performance is going to be because we need to spend less effort on canceling interference. We will drop users randomly in different regions. We will consider a far field scenario from the Fraunhofer distance up to twice that number a near field scenario from twice the length of our array up to the Fraunhofer distance divided by seven and a mixed field containing all of this range. Here I'm showing you the number of users versus the average sum spectral efficiency. It's a downlink scenario with 64 antennas at 15 gigahertz. We have curves for the mixed field, the far field and the near field. They are not too different from each other, but there are some small variations. Then we have the black curve here showing you the ideal case when the user channels are all the time orthogonal to each other. And this is going to happen, for example, if you take your spatial DFT and put out users at these exact locations of the spatial frequency bins. So the user channels are always orthogonal to each other. And that is a far field scenario where you can in principle do that. It's not likely to happen in practice, but it is an upper bound on what can actually be achieved. Even if we are not reaching the upper bound, it seems like the near field curve is a little bit better than the other. So let's take a closer look at those kind of benefits. So now we have the same setup, but we have the same number of antennas as users. Here we have this upper bound, and here we have cumulative distribution functions of the performance that we are getting for different random user drops. And we can see that the CDF curve is actually shifted to the right towards bigger numbers when we are dropping users only in the near field. We have the same number of spatial degrees of freedom equal to the number of antennas, n. So that is the number of users that we at maximum can serve. And that is the size of our vector space, so we cannot orthogonal more user channels than that, whatever we are doing. But we can see that when we are dropping users in the near field, because the channels are depending both on the angle and the distance, we have a larger chance that these kind of random channels are well separable from each other. So there are certainly benefits of near field communications from that perspective, when we have random user locations.
even if a far field case which uses at exactly the DFT angles are going to be the best thing. I will end by providing a general model of near field or far field channels. So we know that any channel vector can be described as an inverse DFT matrix times the DFT coefficients because it's a linear combination of the far field array response vectors for the different frequencies in our spatial DFT times these coefficients. But if we want to describe it in different ways, we can do that. Each A vector describes a plane wave and we can expand the plane wave as a continuum of spherical waves. And what we can then do is to write the whole thing as a summation, or in this case, integral of near field array response vectors multiplied with some kind of coefficients. And then we take the integral over all the angles and all the distances that we can consider. So remember, this was the shape of a near field array response vector. So this is a general thing you can do. And if we are having a fading channel, well then it will be the G coefficients here that are random. In a non-line of sight scenario where G is complex Gaussian distributed, well then H will be complex Gaussian as well. So we get Rayleigh fading with a spatial correlation matrix R, which is calculated in a very similar way, but we replace G with F here, which is described in some kind of probability density function of having different components from angles and distances like this. So depending on where we have our scattering clusters, we get different F functions and that will lead to different spatial correlation matrices. So for example, we can consider that all the clusters are in a particular angular region between theta one and theta two, and in a distance range from D1 to D2. And here I'm now showing you the eigenvalues that we are getting for these spatial correlation matrices. And we have free curves, which is when we have scatters over all angles from zero to pi, but at different distance ranges. And this is giving us these curves here, which are roughly the same. And it shows us that in this case here with 256 antennas, so we have 256 eigenvalues, all of them are non-zero. Some are bigger than the others, but we have a full rank channel and there is not that much of differences between far field or near field. But if we have only a smaller angular range here, then we get some different curves depending on where our scatterings are in distance. And that is because when they are closer, they are spreading out over more spatial frequencies than when they are further away. And that then leads to that when we have the smallest interval, we have the largest number of non-zero eigenvalues for this spatial correlation matrix. So in summary, when we have n antennas, we have n dimensional channels. And any channel can be described as a linear combination of a far field array response vectors for equally spaced spatial frequencies. And they are coming from our spatial DFT. It is the same representation, the near field and the far field, but a plane wave only needs one spatial frequency while a spherical wave is spreading out over many. We can serve up to n users, which might be in the near field or the far field or somewhere in between, but it's always the same number. The ideal case would be that the users are actually in the far field at different angles that are matching with the spatial DFT. But if we put out the users randomly, there's a bigger chance that they are having compatible channels if they are in the near field. Finally, any channel can also be described as an integral of near field array response vectors if you want to do that instead of using the spatial DFT. If you want to have more details, you can read our paper about spatial frequencies and degrees of freedom in the signal processing magazine. And you can also watch my video, Three Misconceptions in Near Field Communications on YouTube. Thank you for listening.